Denver agrees to pay up after its fund for women and minority-owned businesses collapsed. As the Colorado GOP turns, a last-minute twist, it saves the state party chairman from likely losing his job tomorrow, as even more prominent Republicans call on him to go. Making Denver's largest music fest open to everyone. And we celebrate the opening night of the Olympics by unveiling the underdog country that we'll be rooting for along with the U.S. Anybody recognize it? You will after tonight on Next. Denver's Fund for Women and Minority-Owned Businesses was a pioneering project that started with great hope and ended in anger and a lawsuit. Today, the city announced it would pay up the money owed to the fund and end the partnership. Two years ago, Denver City Council set aside $15 million in marijuana tax revenue over three years for a fund to help those small businesses. The city worked with a private venture capital firm on the project. That group, called the Demi Fund, sued the city earlier this year, said that Denver only paid out $6 million of the $15 million promised, then said the city fund was out of money, left them hanging for $800,000 in unpaid expenses. City leaders then accused the fund of shoddy record-keeping, said that was the reason that it cut off payments. Both sides have now reached a settlement requiring Denver to reimburse the fund for $800,000 in unpaid invoices. The two sides released a joint statement today putting a happy spin on what became an ugly relationship. It said, quote, creating something new is not easy and said that the city will continue to look for ways to partner with traditionally disadvantaged businesses. Tonight, there is a pause in the civil war between Colorado Republicans. A judge has stepped in to stop a meeting tomorrow where GOP state chairman Dave Williams was likely to get voted out by his fellow Republicans. The temporary restraining order just delays the inevitable confrontation between the ultra-Trumpist wing of the party led by the state chairman and the Republicans who say that kind of ideology in our state is, as Donald Trump would say, a loser. That is one of just several developments today in the effort to remove the state chairman from leadership. Fridays are for soap opera cliffhangers. Our Marshall Zellinger details quite a few ins and outs as the Colorado GOP turns. An Arapahoe County judge has delayed the Republican on Republican effort to oust party chairman Dave Williams. Williams went to court and was granted a temporary restraining order preventing Saturday's meeting from happening that could possibly remove him as party chair. That meeting was put on hold on the same day six Republicans running for Congress in Colorado called on Williams to resign. Congresswoman Lauren Boebert did not call for his resignation, but in a social media post wrote, quote, This isn't about competing policies or ideologies. This is about a failure from Chairman Williams to lead after our primary election. Saturday's meeting to try to remove Williams was called for by El Paso County GOP Vice Chair Todd Watkins. If that vote took place and succeeded, four people were ready to replace Williams. State lawmaker Richard Holtorf, former U.S. Senate candidate Eli Bremer, former Route County Treasurer Britta Horn, and Douglas County GOP Chairman Stephen Peck. In issuing the temporary restraining order preventing that meeting, the judge said Williams, quote, demonstrated a reasonable probability of success in having the court determine that Watkins had no authority calling Saturday's meeting. Watkins had submitted 112 signatures last month, saying he had enough internal support to call a meeting to remove Williams. Submitting those signatures started a clock for a meeting to take place. That's why Republicans met last week in a shady place under a bridge in Bayfield in far southwest Colorado. That meeting was to check the box saying we held a meeting and was quickly adjourned. The next official meeting of the Colorado GOP is August 31st. However, Saturday's meeting could still happen. The judge said a $1,000 bond must be paid in order for the temporary restraining order preventing the meeting to be in effect. That bond has not yet been paid. I spoke with Todd Watkins, who still plans to hold that meeting tomorrow. I asked him, well, aren't you at risk of violating a temporary restraining order should that bond be paid? And he joked, what, can they stop us from roasting marshmallows together? So ultimately, if he finds out that the bond hasn't been paid and the restraining order is not enforceable, they're going to go ahead with the vote, although maybe people will be scared away from showing up and they won't have enough people. There's so much more drama that's going to happen on a special weekend edition of the soap opera. So to kind of like take a step back, this reminds me of like the scene 
when the car careens off the cliff but hits a tree on the way down. It slows down the process, but what's going to happen is likely to eventually happen. Yeah, that's good. I like to think of maybe like a Rodney Dangerfield ending of a movie where he freezes. Like it, the picture doesn't freeze. He's just frozen like, <laughs> and they're kind of frozen in time. Oh man, wild stuff as the GOP turns. Marshall, thank you. Voters in a mountain town will soon decide whether to expand voting rights to businesses. Don't give the US Supreme Court any ideas, right? But Mountain Village is considering voting rights for entities that own local residential properties, giving voting rights to LLCs and trusts. The question will be before voters in Mountain Village, right outside Telluride, next year. If voters approve a change to the charter, the owners of more than 700 LLCs and trusts would be eligible to vote in their municipal elections, not like state or federal elections. That could have a huge impact on local elections because Mountain Village only has a population of about 1,200 people. Supporters say it would give a voice to property owners who pay taxes in that resort community. And owners of commercial properties in LLCs, they will not get those same voting rights. Mountain Village is already the only town in Colorado that lets second homeowners vote in local elections, even if they don't live there full time. The Olympic opening ceremonies from Paris will replay tonight at 6.30 on 9 News, right after this program. Prepare for a heaping helping of USA, USA, for the next 17 days. Now listen. Here at Next, we love us some America. I mean, right? Okay? But everybody around here is going to be rooting for America, except your super woke niece. So, in addition to cheering for the U.S. Olympic team, Next has a tradition of adopting another nation each Olympics, right? A long shot that we can root for together. Cannot say that we've had a lot of success. May we make the case for Liberia. The 2020 Summer Games, pandemic delayed into 2021, we all cheered for Liberia, but they did not get their first medal. At Poor Nation scrapped together the funding to send three track and field athletes to Tokyo. Their best sprinter did well, finished fifth. 2022, we backed Iceland. You couldn't order just one of the flags on Amazon. Uh, because, I mean, how can a country called Iceland not have a single Winter Games medal? Well, it's because they have a population smaller than that of Aurora, Colorado. That's why. But alas, no medal for Iceland, despite our very best efforts. This year, together, we are cheering on a nation that's been called the Colorado of Europe. To be fair, that was just one tour guide site on Facebook. And I can think of a bunch of other countries in Europe that are a lot more like Colorado than this one. But... They have mountains, they have a coast, they've never won a single Olympic medal, and you know what? They have a real shot this year with a tiny Olympic team of just eight athletes. Ladies and gentlemen, strike up the national anthem, hymni flamurit, hymn to the flag. No, you don't know by now? All right, let's hear it for Albania, the Balkan nation of 2.4 million people, smaller than Colorado. 11,000 square miles, about a tenth the size of our state. This little country is primed for its first Olympic medal. Now, you likely have some questions about Albania. Let's bring that anthem back up a little bit. Let's go through the questions. Questions like, where is Albania? Think Greece, go north. Is Albania a U.S. ally? Absolutely. We're very cool with them. Wasn't Albania communist? It was. Thank you for asking. Not anymore. What are Albania's leading exports? Nobody's actually asking that, I, know, I understand. But I looked it up, and after oil, it's leather shoes and parts of shoes. Hey, speaking of people who need the boot, Russian President Vladimir Putin. How does Albania feel about that guy? Not super. Albania wants to join the EU. They're pro-Western, pro-Ukraine. In fact, Albania's best shot at its first ever medal is with some wrestlers that they poached off the Russian national team. Their head of the wrestling federation called it a theft against the Russian state. As the Paris Olympics get underway, go USA and Albania. That's nice. That anthem slaps. Hey, you're doing something beautiful in Littleton and Arapahoe County this week. You are buying meals for total strangers who are not strangers for very long. This week's Word of Thanks microgiving campaign is supporting the nonprofit Graceful Foundation. They're the people behind Littleton's Graceful Cafe. That beautiful spot in Littleton is open to everyone, whether they can afford to pay for their meal or not. It is one of the rare places 
where everyone is welcomed and everyone is greeted with kindness and hospitality. About 90 of the meals they serve per day are paid for by donations like ours. They call them their grace in action meals. The Graceful Foundation makes change inside and outside the walls of that cafe. The nonprofit deploys its lived experience action teams. They're Coloradans who know the challenges of mental health struggles, homelessness, hunger, people who then go and speak and lead throughout Arapahoe County, putting a name and a face on some of our community's most persistent challenges. They connect people, they include people, and it begins with the meals that we're paying for today. You have already raised more than $13,000 for that nonprofit. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 to get the link to donate. This is the week in which your generosity is likely to top the $13 million mark. A big part of that is that 3,000 of you have now signed up to simplify your giving with a monthly donation to the Word of Thanks Fund. You never miss a week and you don't get your email inbox filled with mail. You just help us start each weekly microgiving campaign with $22,000 in extra donations. Use that same QR code or text to get there. We're here to make the festival more accessible to everyone. That everybody can get around and have fun at one of Colorado's largest music festivals. And it's the Paris Olympics, Colorado style. We asked some people getting pumped for the games. Our favorite Friday question, what's your good news? This weekend's underground music showcase on South Broadway is Denver's largest music festival. But for decades, some fans have been stuck on a side stage. Now a new accessibility team is making sure that everybody gets to enjoy the festival. We know. The UMS is always like one of the wildest weekends. It's a really dope weekend of Denver music. Hey, my name's Kaylin. I'm from the Bam Wheelchair Sports Camp, and I am this year's accessibility lead at the UMS 2024. We're here to make the festival more accessible to everyone. This is the second year at UMS that we've done accessibility efforts, and our biggest challenge was surveying such a broad scope of Broadway. What up? We rolled in and out of every venue that's got live music and we made sure that the bathrooms are big or small or how tall the sinks are or how flat the floors are what the floors are made of just really laying out what venues have and don't have i want to hold my city a little bit more accountable like i can't make the whole world accessible overnight but i can use my influence here in Denver, and it's been really great to have this platform at UMS. Yeah, it's been really great to just channel some of my frustrations with access into the biggest music festival in Colorado. See you, dude. See ya. Finally Friday, and finally the air quality alert has been canceled. We're tracking isolated storms tonight that might actually bring a little bit of rain. We need it. We've got a chance of storms tonight and again tomorrow, and then it's going to be really warm and really dry. The wind's shifting now coming in out of the west and southwest. That's helped to scour out the bad air. Air quality has been canceled, that air quality alert, and also the red flag warning has been canceled. Much improved, and we'll see these scattered storms not hold together very well as they cross the I-25 corridor. We are are not in the outlook for severe weather tonight or tomorrow. But there is a chance of rain from a few of these storms as they move through. Temperatures in the early evening in the low 80s, mid-evening in the mid-70s. Tomorrow, low 90s with an afternoon storm and then hot and dry. Sunshine with mid to upper 90s for Sunday, Monday. Well, all the way through the end of next week. Parts of southeast Colorado could soon become Colorado's first news desert after a string of local media closures this year. It's the first in what become, could become a worsening trend because there are dozens of Colorado newspaper owners preparing to leave the business. After 137 years in print, the owners of the Plainsman Herald down in Springfield announced last week they'll print their final issues in December. Like a lot of small local papers, they said that decreasing ad revenue was not enough to cover their costs. 
According to a database compiled by the Colorado News Collaborative, Baca County, far southeast Colorado, is going to be left without a local newspaper when the Herald closes. And other communities across Colorado could follow in their footsteps. Two other eastern Colorado papers, the Burlington Record in Kit Carson County and the Lamar Ledger in Prowers County, they also announced plans to close just within the last week. In a 2019 survey done by the Colorado Media Project, dozens of local news publishers said that they were preparing to leave the industry. 44 uh, local news publishers across Colorado had told us that they're reaching retirement age or otherwise trying to get out of the business. And a real question is what is going to happen when they do? Is somebody going to step up from the community to keep that newspaper alive or will it just disappear and will people have to get their information somewhere else? That was Corey Hutchins. His weekly newsletter, Inside the News in Colorado, is a great free resource if you care about the future of journalism in Colorado and what's being done to save it. Hutchins points out that a lot of Colorado's small papers were already hit hard because they lost their regional printer earlier this year when Gannett shut down the Pueblo Chieftain's printing plan. My good news is that I'm going on a river trip. Do you love America if you don't paint it on your face to start the Olympics? Our favorite Friday tradition rolls on next. Different things about the Olympics appeal to different people. The intense competition, the athletic excellence, the international camaraderie, the excuse to hit a bar at 11 a.m. for a watch party. We stopped by one to ask our favorite Friday question. What's your good news? My good news is that, uh, you know, we're having a great summer so far. I just kind of wanted to support USA. To be here at 11 a.m. on a Friday, you know, uh, definitely means that people care and they want to be here. My good news is that I'm here in Colorado from Tucson, Arizona, and I'm out of the house. My good news is that my mom's going to be um, a preschool teacher at Nativity. My good news is that I just got a brand new puppy and my sister's coming to town this weekend to meet him. We are here in Denver on a couples trip, so we all woke up today and we're going to celebrate together. My good news is that I was nominated for co-captain on my horseback riding team. My good news is I've been in business for about a year and a half and I just had the best sales week of the year. Our good news? We're going to Kenny Chesney tomorrow night. There's certain things that I love about the Olympics, and I think that's what, what's great about them is there's a sport for everyone, uh, something for everyone to kind of cheer on or, or have fun watching, and then also, you know, uh, something for uh, the community and a nation to kind of get behind and rally behind, too. The good news is it's my mom's birthday tomorrow, so I wish I would like to wish her a happy birthday. And another good news, I get to finally have lunch with my friend Murray. My good news is that I'm going on a river trip. Having the Olympics here really helps kind of reinvigorate that crowd. It's the one question that always makes us smile. That's why we end the week that way. We are back with your feedback about Albania next. Steve writes in tonight to say, who picked out your wardrobe this evening? America did, Steve. Talk to America about it. Uh, Lauren agrees with me that the Albanian national anthem slaps. It's really cool. Uh, if you read the lyrics in English, though, there's some pretty dark stuff about, like, traitors. So, uh, yeah, but, man, no, I mean, that thing, that thing rocks for sure. Um, Robin, on threads, we're on threads, you know. She says, all right, Kyle, I'll root for Albania this time. Damn skippy, you will, Robin. Megan said, I had a really hard day, but the piece on Albania made me laugh. Who says the news has to make you feel terrible? It's a horrendous idea.